Backyard Green Films is proud to present this episode of Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Alara and her husband, Rick, travel throughout the land in their teardrop trailer that they have nicknamed Maggie, bringing you stories about their travels and the people they meet. They visit farmers, ranchers, and just about anyone who loves putting their hands in the dirt or their feet in stirrups. For the past three years, they have been filming a documentary about heritage breed animals entitled The Holstein Dilemma, Heritage Breeds, and the Need for Biodiversity. In those travels, they have gotten to meet some very interesting people. Here's one of those interviews. Hi, this is Alara. As most of you know from our introduction, for the last few years, we've been filming a documentary on heritage breeds and biodiversity. Everything has a starting point, and this next interview was where we began. Wow. I don't know if it was a wonderful way to start or a terrible way to start, but I can tell you that I was never so nervous in my life as I was when I learned that we had the opportunity to speak with the very accomplished, very well-spoken, very intelligent, and very accomplished... Oops, uh, did I say that already? Let me say it again. Very accomplished Dr. Carrie Fowler. We have to thank the Livestock Conservancy for introducing us to Dr. Fowler as both parties have a passionate interest in the need for biodiversity. Dr. Fowler is an author, an activist, farmer, and a scientist. His alma maters include Rhodes College, Simon Fraser University, and Uppsala University, where he has a PhD in sociology. If his name has not immediately rung a bell, the first association that most people have with Dr. Fowler is that he put together the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. That's that big safe deposit box of seeds that's in Norway, about 800 miles from the North Pole. It's located in statistically one of the safest places on the planet in case of global crises or adverse conditions. So it's the perfect place to store 850,000 unique crop varieties from over 233 countries. If you ask Wikipedia, approximately one-third of the genera diversity stored in gene banks globally is represented in this vault. And the samples there are representing over 13,000 years of agricultural history. And Dr. Fowler is the guy that made this place happen. You know that scene in the movie Interstellar where Matthew McConaughey and Anne Hathaway take the restart material to another planet to go reboot the human race and our food supply? We can thank Dr. Fowler for the backup if we actually have to do that thing in our future. He is an author a few times over, most recently of a book entitled Seeds on Ice. He was appointed by President Obama to the Board for International Food and Agricultural Development. He's been interviewed by 60 Minutes, done a TED Talk, been in The New Yorker and Wired magazines, Seeds of Time, the award-winning documentary film, and was on the Futurama Holiday Spectacular. I'll let you decide which one of those is most impressive to you. After you listen to our podcast or before, I won't be offended on this one. Please look him up on his website or even do a quick Google search. Listing all of his accomplishments would take all of our time today. So I'll name a few names of organizations, many of which have convinced him to be on the board of directors or to accept an award from them. Rhodes College, the Global Crop Diversity Trust, the New York Botanical Garden, the Lillian and the Amy Goldman Charitable Trusts, the National Plant Genetic Resources Board, the Thomas Jefferson Medal and Citizen Leadership, the Russian Academy of Agricultural Sciences, the Vavilov Medal, the Heinz Award, Bette Midler's Wind Beneath My Wings Award, three honorary doctorates, and on and on. If you would like a really cool fact, he was there at the Mason Temple when Martin Luther King Jr. made his last speech entitled, I've Been to the Mountaintop. On his farm in the Hudson Valley in New York, he raises red pole cattle, buckeye chickens, runner ducks, pilgrim geese, over a hundred apple varieties, and let us do our interview in the middle of a field of squash plant studies. I was in heaven once I could tamp down the awestruck feeling and figure out how to talk. Most of all, Dr. Fowler is a futurist in the best possible way. I consider myself a true realist at heart and found that on a personal level, this quiet man's worldview and actions appealed to me as a perfect mix of logical pessimism on where we were heading and also very logical action on how to safeguard our future. 
Many of us might acknowledge what's happening to our food systems and our planet, but this man has taken active steps to make sure we're all still around to worry about it in the future. And if we have more than five agricultural seed types in existence 50 years from now, we can no doubt thank Carrie Fowler for it. With no further ado, here's Dr. Carrie Fowler. Please tell me a little bit about yourself and your farm. Uh, well, my name is Kerry Fowler. Um, I've been involved with um, mostly cons conservation of um, biological diversity for agriculture for most of my life. And we're now here in upstate New York, um, near the Hudson River. It's about 100 miles north of New York City, um, a little farm called Over the River Farm. How did you learn about heritage breeds? Um, I think just personality-wise, I've always been interested in diversity. I like differences, and uh, it gives me a lot of joy in my life. So I began uh, learning about heritage breeds probably in the um, 1970s or 80s, uh, when I was um, became aware of the Livestock Conservancy. Would you explain the benefits of having pure strains in your breeding program, and how heritage breeds are important? Sure. Well, since breeds display very different, profoundly different kind of characteristics, um, you, you want, in a sense, it's like having a, an artist with a palette of colors. You want all those colors available to you on your palette to paint a picture. And no one breed can be everything. There is no such thing as a perfect breed that embodies all the characteristics of the breed. So if you were to say, well, agriculture is never going to change again, and the climate is not going to change again, and pests and diseases have stopped their own evolution, and everything is going to remain static, including our own food system and our own human taste, if you could say all those things, then you might say, well, actually, we don't need any more diversity. We'll just have everything stay the way it is. None of those things are true. Everything is changing. So in the future, we need the possibility of crossbreeding one breed with another so that we introduce traits from one breed to another to fashion the kind of animal production system that we really need. And this has been going on since basically time immemorial. This is how we got the breeds that we have today. So nothing terribly strange or immoral or unethical or weird or ahistorical about this. This has always been happening and we, we simply need it to happen in the future because uh, the bottom line is that our agricultural crops and our livestock breeds need to evolve. Um, there, you know, my definition of extinction is when a breed loses the ability to evolve. Um, when that happens, it's just a waiting game until the last individuals die. So we shouldn't get too enamored with um, numbers. You know, we have this number of this breed or that breed. The real question is, do we have enough diversity in the breed to enable it to evolve to the changes that are coming with climate, with diseases, with pests? And if that's the case, then the breed can evolve and it will continue to exist and we don't have to worry about extinction. If we don't have a lot of diversity, we're headed down the route of losing that breed for one reason or another. Would you explain some of the pros and cons of your type of heritage breeds that you learned after you got them? Well, you know, I don't think we found any negative attributes of the, um, of the cows yet. They've just been fantastic. Um, you know, every year we produce a couple of new calves and um, and they give birth out in the field and they protect their, their calves and they uh, produce a lot of milk so the calves um, grow up really quickly. We haven't had any um, significant disease problems and they have good disposition. So, and frankly, I just like the way they look out there. So that's, you know, that's part of it. I'm pleased by that, that vision of the field with those cows in it. Chickens, we, um, we only really have one problem with the chickens. We had one rooster that was getting on the hens a little bit too much and pecking the feathers and everything. We decided in the end that he had to go. And so um, now their peace has been restored in our <laughs> and uh, we have a couple of roosters that are just calm and get along with everybody and um, 
So that was about it. But in general, the chickens too have been much more mellow than um, than any other breed we've ever had. So we, even though we like diversity, we're we're like some other farmers. We fasten on to a particular breed, and we say, well, this is the best. <laughs> And the great thing about diversity is there are a lot of other farmers out there saying, yeah, what we've got is the best, but it's a different breed. <laughs> so that's how, you, that's how you come to have and keep diversity. <laughs> Would you tell me about some of the resources that you used and the things you learned when you were um, finding more information about your breeds? Well, my, <laughs> my experience is that if you contact people that have rare breeds, you better be set to have a long conversation. Um, because people are passionate about their breeds. And so all you have to do is make contact and Livestock Conservancy has a list of breeders. They have a publication where you can see some of these people advertising. Um, there are breed associations and if you join a, an association, we're members of the American Red Pole Association, um, you'll see where all the other members are. and. Um, you're a phone call or a visit away from people who will will probably spend all day with you, uh, talking with you and helping you overcome any difficulties. Uh, it's happened so often. I mean, these people are incredibly gracious and interested in promoting their breed. And, you know, one of the things we try to do, um, pretty uniformly, I think, in the rare breed livestock world, is we say that in order to conserve this breed, we have to eat it. <laughs> because we're not philanthropists here and we can't conserve a breed just by building up the numbers and numbers and numbers and we never, nothing ever happens. If you want to make a breed popular again, you have to make it popular with consumers. So, you know, we need to be able to sell our breed to a restaurant and the restaurant says it's Red Pole Day and these are really special steaks that you're going to get. And the more that that happens, the more of a market there is for red pole cattle or whatever, and the more people, farmers, want to raise them. And that's what's going to get the numbers up and conserve the breed, and also get us more tuned in to breeding those cows in a um, careful way so that they become more productive um, to what the, the market wants. But you can get help on all of those things from either the breed associations or the first stop, I think, is the Livestock Conservancy. The breeds we have here are because of the Livestock Conservancy, because we got a visit from one of the staff members and um, walked around, talked about the land here and what kind of operation we had and what we wanted to have and what kind of time and experience and um, well, and also what kind of traits we wanted in the animals. And they suggested a couple of different breeds. And um, the chicken breed took instantly, I could see, oh, that's it for us. And it proved, you know, really the perfect breed for us. And there were a couple options with the cattle breeds, but um, um, we, we, we think we got the right one. <laughs> And they match the chickens, so that's... <laughs> yeah, they're the same color as the chickens. They're exactly the same color as the chickens. There's something about that color we must like. <laughs> so with heirloom seeds and livestock reproduction and management, I would think that there are a great number of parallels that would exist between the two uh, in practice. So what are the parallels that you see between seeds and livestock? Well, it's true. I mean, most of my life has been uh, involved with seed conservation. Um, there's some parallels, but there's some big differences. Um, one of the problems with, um, with conservation of, let's say, heritage livestock breeds is that you can, you can of course, um, conserve semen and even um, embryos, but that's an expensive proposition and you have to have technology that's ongoing, freezing equipment and such, and so that, that gets into some complications that normal people in a farm or garden situation just can't do. Whereas with seeds, you can freeze them in, a, in your freezer in the kitchen and you can conserve them that way long term. Um, uh, so it's a lot easier to conserve a huge number of seed varieties than it would be a huge number of livestock varieties. On the other hand, if we're trying to convince the public of the importance of conserving diversity, 
you can look in the eyes of a cow and there's some connection and empathy going on there that you can't with a carrot or a type of wheat variety. So, um, so both, there's some similarities, but there's some big differences. So China's gotten more involved in agriculture. And how do you think that's going to change things for the American farmer? Do you think that uh, it makes it more important for us to have heirloom seeds to, uh, for lack of a better term, verify the integrity of the seeds? How do you feel about that? I, I'm, um, I'm not sure how, you know, Chinese involvement in, in um, in seed companies is going to change agriculture for us. They're still going to have to produce things for our market if they want to make a go of it commercially, which I presume they do. Um, what I'm mo most concerned about in this regard is a little bit off to the side of your question, and that is that um, there are many crops for which we have no breeders or very few breeders. Why? Because um, the nature of the crop and the nature of the breeding means that um, you can't make a commercial go out of it. So we have about six banana breeders in the world, in the whole world. We have about six yam breeders in the whole world. And I tell people, you know, that bananas economically are fourth, fifth, sixth most important crop economically in the world year in and year out. Um, yams produce about 40 million metric tons of yams every year, mostly in Africa. Six breeders in the face of the kind of climate and pest and disease issues um, and food security issues that we have. So how are these crops going to continue, because they're domesticated, they don't, um, uh, you know, how are we going to continue to make these crops viable and productive to feed human beings in the future if we only have six people in the whole world, not even one person per country in Africa working on them? And probably half of the crops that we, we have now have probably never been um, worked on by a Mendelian trained plant breeder. Um, and in many cases in the heritage breeds, we have um, not, I would say, sufficient professional breeding going on with those, with those animals. So if I look forward, I think the big challenge is how we're going to manage the diversity we have and push that diversity out to the farms uh, where it can be used by the farmers and the gardeners. Because I think we have to get that diversity, which is the raw material for evolution, in the hands of would-be plant and animal breeders so that we can begin to help those breeds and those varieties, those crops, adapt to tomorrow's climate to tomorrow's pest and disease. So that's my, that's my big issue. My, my concern is not so much with the major crops for which there is um, pretty significant corporate involvement. My, my feeling is that we, we need to be looking at the so-called minor crops, which in terms of acreage are uh, equally important to rice or wheat or corn. Um, and provide a lot of food security. And ditto with the, with the rare breeds of cattle. We need to be looking at those and having a good strategy uh, for those because they're, not, they're going to be important not just in the food production systems in the future, but as genetic resources for all the other breeds and varieties. I heard somebody talk once about the opportunities that you have to get it right in farming. Basically, you have 30 chances in 30 years seasonally to get the concept right. Would you explain that concept, please, and how it applies in terms of farming? Well, for a, for a plant, for a crop, um, like, like corn or wheat or tomatoes or whatever, um, you can make a cross in a, in a single uh, season, putting pollen um, taking pollen from one plant to another and get seed, but typically if you're going to do anything substantial in terms of making a new variety, that's going to take a number of years for you to um, work on that. So we generally think 10, 12 years um, is about the length of time it takes to get a new variety out in the field. And with the climate changing as fast as it has been changing, 
Um, that means we only have a couple of cycles before we, we have a very, very dramatically different kind of climate to grow in. Um, animals um, present a different kind of challenge. They're a little bit more adaptable than plants. They do, after all, move a little bit more easily. Um, but still, if you're going to, if we find um, a need to produce different breeds of animals or to adapt our existing breeds to a new situation, it's going to take, it's going to take time. And it's going to take countless experiments. That's uh, the one thing that we don't uh, appreciate is that American agriculture is here uh, courtesy of countless experiments in the past. Very few of our crops are native to the United States. Um, none of our livestock breeds, uh, none of the livestock species are, are really native. Um, none of the major ones, that is. And um, so how did, how did wheat come to grow from everywhere from Florida to Alaska? It's very different conditions. Um, it came to grow in those different conditions because we spread diversity out and allowed farmers to experiment with it and to make recombinations. Um, you could say they did genetic engineering, but all they did was promote breeding out there in the old days. And, uh, and slowly those crops adapted to the different kind of environments we have. So I think when, in the future, what's really going to be needed, and it's going to be needed both with plants and animals, is to get diversity out of the door, out of the seed banks, out of um, the, um, uh, well, just out into the field where farmers and gardeners can, um, can allow it to, uh, we can produce new combinations and new breeds, new varieties, and adapt to the kind of conditions that are coming. We're already seeing it on this farm that um, we're, we're seeing differences in, in um, I guess we would call it weather rather than climate at this point, but you know, the last few years have certainly been different than, than years before that. And we're altering our planting schedules and what we plant um, because um, normal average is not the same as it used to be. If you could explain to the average person the difference between GMO and what we might call a selective breeding, um, what is the difference between the two? Well, I think, you know, a lot of people think that all of our food in the supermarket's GMO today, but actually, you know, relatively small amount of it is. So, um, in the past, what we're really talking about in terms of a traditional variety versus a GMO variety are uh, the techniques used for pollination and breeding. <laughs> That's about it. So in the past, um, you would take pollen, you might even use a paintbrush, literally, and get the pollen from one flower, deposit it on the, on, on the uh, flower of another plant, harvest the seed from that second plant, and you'd have a, a breeding, <laughs> father and the mother. Um, and so that was, that was pretty traditional. Or the bees would do the work. They'd go from one flower to the next and they'd do it and you'd save the seed and that would be traditional. Um, today with, um, with modern science we have the, the ability to pinpoint particular genes that can be moved uh, in a high-tech way from one plant to another and that, that essentially makes a GMO. Now technically we may be moving the same genes that the bee will move. <laughs> or that I might move with the paintbrush. But the fact that we're moving them um, using these, um, uh, these genetic techniques is, makes, it a, makes it a GMO. So GMO technology has the, has the ability of, of either doing exactly the same thing we've been doing all, all along uh, throughout agricultural history for 12,000 years, or um, the possibility of transferring genes from one um, species, a different species to another, even a very unrelated species. By the way, we do transfer genes regularly and routinely from species to species. There are more than a hundred species of wheat and nobody's concerned about whether there's a gene from one species of wheat going to another. I'm not talking about varieties, that's a different thing. There are probably 200, 300,000 different varieties of wheat, but separated out into um, you know, a certain number of species. Not too many people are concerned about gene flow within those, those species, but uh, with, with um, 
genetic techniques, you can potentially move genes from um, far-flung species into those, um, um, those plants. I've learned of a few examples, one of a poultry disease in the 70s that absolutely ruined the poultry industry. And also, there, I believe there's another one with a wheat blight that came out and just ruined agriculture as we know it at that time. Um, what is your recommendation on how heritage breeds might be able to introduce genetics that could help to save us from these problems? Well, you know, every once in a while, um, a disease will mutate. And all of a sudden, a disease that that has been dormant or that you didn't think was very economically important just explodes and becomes an epidemic and none of the plants or animals in the field are are uh, resistant or immune to it and you get massive wipeouts we're dealing with a wheat situation right now and we in the past have dealt with avian influenza which um, destroyed a, a lot of flocks of chickens and others um, the thing you assume is that somewhere in the background of that um, crop or that, that, uh, or that particular type of animal, they've seen that disease before, they've seen that mutation before. You sort of assume that, uh, at least you hope it. So you begin scouring around to see if you can find resistance to that particular variant. And sometimes you only find it in a couple of genes in a particular variety, and that's what saves the crop. And the interesting thing is this goes on routinely with some of our major crops, for example, and we're sort of blissfully unaware of that as consumers, how close we come to gigantic disasters um, right now with wheat and bananas, next year with who knows what, and the only if everybody were growing the same variety in the field or had the same breed of cow in the field because it was the most productive, wow, what would happen <laughs> when some disease came through and found the first individual attractive and vulnerable? Well, if that's the case, it's going to find every individual attractive and vulnerable if there's genetic uniformity in the field. So you need that diversity as a backup when these kind of tragedies occur and you need to then introduce those traits into the gene pool of the, of the varieties you're using for your food system. There's a quote in Jurassic Park where they talk about life on the edge of chaos and they talk about too much change and animals can't keep up, not enough and there's no impetus to change. So we've had huge changes in our planet in the last couple of years. How do we keep up and how do we adapt in time? Well, you know, one thing it's, I think it's important to realize is that um, agricultural breeds and, and uh, varieties of crops are, are not outside of the confines of evolution. <laughs> it's not like uh, the wild plants and animals in the tropical forest, there's where evolution occurs. But once you get into the farm, the principles of evolution don't apply anymore. They do. The difference is that what we deal with is domesticated. And that means that their evolution is in our hands, literally in our hands. We make the choice of which um, bull and cow to breed, which breeds to cross, which seeds to save. We make those choices. So one, so that evolution, that future, that crop or breed is, is truly in our hands. And that requires that we pay attention. <laughs> we, we figure out that, ah, you know, this is the plant that I want to um, breed with the other one down here because I like one of these characteristics and I want it in that because I like some characteristics of that other plant. Same thing with, with breeds. So that's, you know, I, I think in the future, part of, of saving, conserving these um, old heritage breeds is really gonna come down to our own human culture and the way that we approach this. And that means that we have to be observant and careful and, um, and good, uh, skillful at our own breeding work. I guess, you know, the other thing that it strikes me is that, and I hate to say this because if you, many people that are conserving rare breeds uh, conserve them because, like, like us, 
they think they've got a great breed and it fits in perfectly with their farming situation. And that's good, but it's okay in my mind at a certain point, at least for some people, to begin to experiment with that and to help the breed edge it towards a different kind of profile, a different kind of look with different combinations of traits. Um, that's what our farming ancestors did. That's how we got the breeds that we have here today. Um, they weren't farmers in the old days who were creating these heritage breeds. They weren't in the business of creating and uh, preserving a particular breed. They were in production agriculture. <laughs> they wanted a breed that worked. And if our heritage breeds don't work, then we need to help them adapt so that they will work properly and be productive. And how do we do that? We don't do it if we don't have diversity. <laughs> so we need to introduce diversity into our crops and, and heritage breeds at, at certain points, I think. That's the long-term view. But um, that's, uh, I, I think the bottom line is that we're in the game of evolution. And that's why we need diversity because Without diversity, there's no evolution, and without evolution, there's only extinction. If you could apply systems theory practically for the average person, what would you say to them about the interconnectedness of nature? Well, I think if you, for me, you know, reading Charles Darwin sort of puts it in perspective because you see that everything is connected and we're, um, everything is in the process of evolution, I would say even co-evolution, so our domesticated crops are evolving with us actually and, and at, our, at our feet and at our hands. So, you know, I understand that our food system is very much based on large-scale production, um, but this large-scale large production is, is not a is not the kind of agricultural system that's dominated agriculture for the last 12,000 years. <laughs> so it remains to be seen as to whether we'll have this type of system of agriculture for the next 12,000 years. Because in the past, we've had much smaller scale, um, integrated, mixed agricultural systems. And I'm not so sure we're not going to be there again someday. Um, it may be that that's what works best um, in an evolutionary and even in an economic sense. I don't know. I guess one of, you know, one of the reasons fundamentally that I think it's so important to conserve these rare breeds and, and, and varieties is that we just don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what's coming in agriculture. We don't know what the next pest or disease is going to mean. We don't know what climate is, what, what's going to happen to the climate. So it just behooves us to save all the pieces. I think it was, you know, it was Aldo Leopold who said that the first rule of successful tinkering is to save all the pieces. <laughs> and that's what we're doing. If we were gods, if we, if we had a perfect vision of what was going to happen in the future, then we could just say, well, this is the best diversity to conserve. We need this variety, we need this breed, but we don't need the other. So we can get rid of it. Just conserve the best. But today's best is, is tomorrow's lunch for some new insect uh, or some new disease. So we don't know. We're not perfect, and that means we have to conserve this diversity because conserving diversity is conserving our options. And Lord knows what we need in this world are options. And that's where we get it, diversity. If you liked our podcast, please subscribe. This is how we keep going. And please tell your friends to join us. Please join us next week when we interview James Beard Award winner Adam Danforth on location in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We want to thank Dr. Kerry Fowler for having us at his Over the River Farm. For more information about Dr. Fowler, please visit his website at kerryfowler.com. We'd also like to thank the Livestock Conservancy for the introduction to Dr. Fowler. To find out more about heritage breed animals, please visit the Livestock Conservancy at their website, livestockconservancy.org. You have been listening to Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Please tune in for more upcoming episodes from our travels. We'd also like to thank our producer, Michelle Council. I'm Rick Bowman, your behind-the-scenes editor. Until next time. 
This has been a presentation of Backyard Green Films Productions. All rights reserved. Copyright 2019.